Uh, welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you're all having a really good conference so far. It's always a pleasure to uh, have an opportunity to speak and to network with folks that care about uh, critical data. Today, I'm going to talk about building a disaster recovery strategy for JIRA and uh, why I think you need one. So let's get going. Hopefully, the screen is working out. I assume somebody will let me know if it's not. Um, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to touch on the elements of a good disaster recovery strategy. Um, we're going to talk about testing. Having a strategy is one thing, but being reasonably confident that it's going to work the day you need it is pretty important. And that's where testing really will come in. The last thing we're going to talk about is, uh, is backing up and restoring JIRA specifically. Wouldn't be a JIRA conference if we didn't touch on backing up your JIRA cloud instance. So those are the three things. Um, my name's James, I'm the CTO and co-founder here at a company called Rewind. Um, we're a business that started on the belief that people should really be focused on building value for their customers and not worrying about data loss. Um, to that end, Rewind provides backup and recovery services for a myriad of tools, including Jira, but we also provide backup services for Confluence, for Bitbucket, for Trello, um, and for GitHub. We also provide backup for other services as well, um, outside of what we consider to be the, uh, the developer tools listed here. I think it's a good place to get started with kind of the most pressing question and maybe the, um, the, the tagline for this talk, which is why do you actually need a disaster recovery strategy when you're thinking about Jira and really cloud apps in general. I'm kind of willing to bet that of the folks that are in this presentation today, there's probably two categories that you fall into. There's the folks that have been responsible for running Jira on premise, and they know what it means to maintain a resilient system. Those folks are probably thinking about the coming migration from Jira Server to Jira Cloud. I think it's next year, March, maybe. Uh, and they're wondering, how am I going to adapt my disaster recovery strategy after my data migrates? And then there's the other folks in the room. They're the ones that were probably tasked with subscribing to Jira because it's one of the best tools for project tracking. And they have no clue why there's a talk about disaster recovery strategy in this conference because they're using the cloud version, which is totally awesome. And it's managed by the good people at Atlassian who absolutely have their back when things will inevitably go wrong someday. To that first group of people, I hear you. Uh, for the rest of you, you're probably in for a bit of a surprise. While the cloud is safe, your data is actually not. This is about as controversial as I'm going to get in this presentation. Don't get me wrong. Of course, cloud apps and public cloud providers, they absolutely do their best to keep their services as secure as they possibly can. It's really in their best interest of doing so. Most of them, if not all of them, have mi uh, mitigation plans in place should something happen to really disrupt the continuity of their business. And we're talking about something like like a database upgrade that goes completely wrong and millions of records suddenly get destroyed and lost forever. Um, or perhaps a critical infrastructure change that inadvertently disables access to critical services for hundreds of users for over a week. You know, something like that. Um, but the reality is that what doesn't exist on their part is a strategy to cover recover your specific data. And if you don't believe me, here's a really bad idea. Like, I, I really don't encourage you to do this, but in the name of science and for the doubters out there, you could give this a try. But I don't want to be held responsible for the outcome. So here's what you should do, but you really shouldn't do this. Tomorrow morning, I want you to log into your production JIRA instance, and I want you to find the busiest project that you have, the one where everyone is interacting with it, lots of issues, lots of comments. And I just want you to delete it. I'm talking like delete it, wipe it from the trash. Then go pick up the phone and call Atlassian and ask them to bring it back for you. 
Now, remember, I said this is a bad idea because I actually know it's very unlikely that Atlassian is going to be able to help you. And how do I know that? It's because I read the terms of service and it's actually right there in black and white. Section 5.2, you can look this up. Go to Atlassian.com slash legal slash cloud dash terms dash of dash service. And it's right there and we've highlighted it for you. We assume no responsibility or liability for your data. And to be fair to Atlassian, it's, it's not just them. Most cloud application providers have very similar wording in their terms of service, letting their customers know that they have to have their own strategy in place to safeguard their data. And the reason for that is because user level data is always the user's responsibility. This table here, bear with me, it's a little complicated, I suppose, but it illustrates what we call the shared responsibility model. And that model is just simply a framework that outlines the responsibilities of cloud service providers and all of their customers or their users. And it explains how every aspect is secured within the cloud environment. So if you take a close look at this, something you'll see is that if you run things on premise, you're responsible for everything, the data, the application, the operating systems, networking, all the way down to um, physical hardware and physical security. But if you're using infrastructure as a service, you'll note the responsibility kind of becomes 50-50. You're responsible for the data, the application that's running on it, but things like network, physical, um, hardware and security, still the responsibility of the infrastructure provider. And by the time you make it all the way to the cloud application side, it's about 80-20. But at no point does the cloud service provider ever take responsibility for your data. It's always up to you to be responsible for it. And so what's that mean? It means that a disaster recovery strategy is something that you actually need to think about. It's not a nice to have. And you can stop and ask yourself, what do I do if my JIRA instance disappeared tomorrow? Or what would the impact to my team be if last week's worth of JIRA data suddenly went missing? How you answer those questions can really help frame your strategy. And there's a lot more to think about as well. It always seems to come back to risk, right? Um, the makeup of your disaster recovery strategy is really a function of your risk tolerance. Plain and simple. You should start by assessing all of your cloud apps and identifying those that are critical from those that are less critical. This is going to help you allocate resources in your strategy way more effectively. And this kind of makes sense, right? The more critical the data, the higher the resource allocation you may give it. And don't get me wrong, that's not to say that you should ignore less critical data, but it's a good thought process that really helps you prioritize things. Next, you should really consider your location and the industry in which you work and think about whether they bind you to any kind of compliance requirements. Certain regulations may dictate how you approach your strategy. For example, if you're in the healthcare or the fintech industry, you probably have very specific guidelines on backups. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about your recovery strategy. Next, it's really important that you identify your threat vectors. And yes, there are all kinds of external and malicious actors. Those things are real. But what the data actually tells us is that more often than not, the problems are with your own people. You know, the threat is inside the building, that kind of thing. So you want to have a good understanding of who has access to your data and what they're doing with it. You can ask yourself, does everyone access the data with administrative privileges? If so, that's not really a good thing. Can people connect third-party systems to your data? Those types of things really matter when you're thinking about the risks. The next, you want to have some real conversations with stakeholders, and you want to really try and quantify the costs of downtime. If critical JIRA data disappeared tomorrow, what's the business impact? If you lost the last week's worth of JIRA data, how is productivity going to change? It's really important to put numbers on paper, real numbers on paper, and align with stakeholders to make sure that everybody's on the same page as to what those costs could be. 
And then last but not least, it's time to think about how much you can realistically allocate to disaster recovery efforts, including mitigation measures. It's one thing to plan for a disaster, and it's another thing to back that plan with real legitimate investment. This is where understanding the cost of downtime and making sure that there's strong alignment between your stakeholders is really your biggest asset in this process. If you can show that the cost of downtime is X and the cost to mitigate is Y and Y is less than X, then you know, usually those investment conversations are very, very easy to have. Okay, so now you kind of have an understanding of your risks, which is great. It's time to look at the elements that go into a disaster recovery strategy. There's three things you probably want to think about. First, you should work with your stakeholders to define your RPO and your RTO. Next, you want to define your accountability list. And finally, you want to think about how are you going to implement your strategy? Some of you maybe opened up a new tab and started Googling what RPO and RTO actually mean. So we should probably take a moment to define these uh, wonderful three-letter acronyms. RPO stands for Recovery Point Objective. It's the maximum allowable amount of data loss or the point in time from which data must be recovered. RPO is, is a way to think about how much data you can afford to lose. So for example, if you take backups every 24 hours at midnight and something were to happen at 11.59 p.m., you'd lose at least a day's worth of data. That may or may not be acceptable to you, but that kind of gives you an idea of how to think about RPO. RTO stands for recovery time objective, and this is the maximum downtime a system is allowed to suffer before it must successfully be restored. RTOs determine that like if critical data loss occurs, how quickly do we expect recovery to be? So if we use that previous example, if your RTO was 48 hours, then you actually could lose two days worth of data. You'd lose the 23 hours and 59 minutes that was not backed up because the disaster took place just before the backup process was meant to kick off. But you'd also lose the 24 hours of data that never made it into the data set in the first place because of the 20, extra 24 hours of downtime, courtesy of the 48 hour RTO. So decisions in your strategy around data protection and backups are largely informed by your RPO and your RTO. And that's why they're really important to define and get right. When you're defining your RPO and your RTO, you generally want to examine two things. For RPO, you generally care about how quickly the data set is changing. And for RTO, you generally care about the criticality of the data or more specifically the business impact of the data loss itself. If a data set doesn't change very frequently, your RPO is easier to manage since the amount of data loss is minimal the farther back in time you have to go. If the data set changes every second though, your RPO is actually a lot more difficult to manage because the volume of data loss, it actually grows with every passing second. If a data set isn't considered very critical, then your RTO can be quite long because the business impact is presumably quite low. But if that data is critical, then it's actually really desirable for that RTO to be much shorter because the business impact is likely a lot higher. But let's be real here. Like stakeholders, they always want things to go back to the exact same way that it was as quickly as possible. And that's where it's really your job when making a disaster recovery strategy to help them understand what's realistic, what's achievable given the risk tolerance assessment you completed and the investment they're willing to commit to. Okay, so we've defined RPO, we've defined RTO. Now it's time to assemble the team that's gonna be responsible for executing the strategy when that inevitable day comes. You can think about an accountability list similar to an escalation matrix. What you're doing here is you're identifying the specific people from your team that need to be in the room and their roles and responsibilities when they are present. Being specific here is, is really important. Disaster recovery is a very, very stressful moment for any business. And if there are people in the room 
that aren't actively contributing to that recovery effort, then they're actually a distraction. And in my experience, they're going to hurt your RTO. So being specific is also important when you're assigning responsibilities as well. You really want people to be in a place where it's crystal clear what's expected of them. You want to get to the point where you can say that person X is responsible for this and person Y is responsible for that. And if this person's not available, then, you know, that person's going to jump in and, and so on. There really aren't the kinds of things you want to figure out in the midst of a real disaster, because obviously your objectives is to try and recover as quickly as possible. And note our pro tip here. Um, as you document these things, it's really important for these lists to be clear in your DR strategy. It's not good enough to say something like um, the IT manager will be responsible for this. Because um, if that IT manager's name is Mary, then you want to be sure you put Mary's name in the list. And this is a pro tip that actually came about when we were uh, looking at our own disaster recovery strategies one day. And we asked somebody new to the team, you know, can you review this, give us feedback? And their first question is, who's the IT manager? We were like, right, you've never met that person before. That's a problem. Um, so again, be specific, be clear how you're identifying these. Okay, we've defined our objectives. We've identified and assembled the team. The last major element of your disaster recovery strategy is your backup strategy. There's always more than one way of accomplishing backups, but you can really um, come to the right conclusions by asking yourself a few simple questions. Am I going to invest in building something or do I want to buy something off the shelf? Do I know how big the data set is? Where am I going to store it? Are there security measures that I need for these backups? Who's going to have access to them? How am I going to manage that access? Do I have to think about retention? And who's going to manage that? Are there privacy or regulation considerations that I need to adhere to? Are there things in the data set that can't be backed up? And what do I do about those things? And how about the three to one rule where it's best practice to have three copies of your data on two different media sources where one of them is off site? How you think about these questions, how you answer these questions will really help define your backup strategy and they'll really round out your overall disaster recovery strategy. Um, final thoughts here uh, to help you think about RPO, RTO, your accountability lists and your backup strategy. It's actually very useful to think about the types of disasters that may impact you. I know I said earlier that your people tend to be the main cause of data disasters, but it is worth considering the other things that can lead to data problems. We can all remember back in April of 2022 when we saw just what happened when JIRA went dark for an extended period of time. And yeah, while the data tells us that uh, disasters tend to be accidental, uh, things like rogue employees with a malicious intention um, can certainly harm as well. Another thing to consider is how many integrations do you have to your data? The thing about integrations is that you're putting your trust in third-party systems and third-party developers. And as a former developer, I would love to say that I always wrote bug-free code. That's just not the case. Um, but yeah, you're trusting that those developers won't impact your data in any way. So take it as you will from the guy who's been running a backup company for over eight years now that disasters really come from anywhere. And it's useful to think about these cases when you're trying to come up with your strategy. The one scenario that still sticks with me to this day um, is when an administrator was performing some critical operation on their data and their cat jumped up on their keyboard and hit just the right combination of keys and wiped out a critical piece of their data. And we thought we had seen it all up till that point, but the cat on the keyboard is definitely, um, definitely to this day, probably the most interesting uh, case of data disaster that, that we've come across. So it's a good idea really to, to try and think about everything. Okay. We've got the makings of a disaster recovery strategy and like any good process, uh, policy, strategy or procedure, um, you have to test it. It's a good idea to test it. And there's a few ways to do this. 
we prefer something called the tabletop test. When these are done right, they're highly collaborative and really fun ways to identify the areas of improving your strategy. Some of you might be looking at the people in this GIF and thinking they seem way too happy to be talking about disaster recovery. But I mean, that's kind of the point when you're doing a tabletop test. They take the stress right out of the situation and they allow the team to focus on validating and refining their strategy without the pressures that come with an actual disaster scenario. And I kind of like to think if you could achieve this level of Zen when an actual crisis strikes, then you know you did something really well in your planning. So we suggest that you start by bringing everyone from your accountability lists together, as well as maybe two to three folks from outside the list um, who have relevant experience. This is different from when disaster strikes. You wouldn't want those two to three folks um, during that scenario, but having them present as a way to help validate the, the, the procedure um, will actually help maybe identify things that you weren't thinking of. And the purpose of this initial meeting, it's really to debug the strategy. Everyone is expected to engage and openly contribute their thoughts and their feedback on, on what's being presented. And you want to spend most of your time discussing the, the decisions that went into the, the, the disaster recovery strategy. And you want to make sure everyone in the room is in agreement on the approach and ideally identify any dependency gaps. So this is a real life example of something that we had discovered. Um, if your backup and recovery depends on the availability of a script, and that script is managed in a source code repository, that source code repository becomes a single point of failure if it's not available when disaster strikes. Fortunately, we back up Git repositories, so we solved that problem. Another example is to ask yourself, how will you contact people in the accountability list? The first time we went through uh, one of our procedures, we realized we didn't have people's phone numbers. We just assumed that we'd all be in the office together. Then the pandemic hit. Oops. <laughs> Point here is, as you discover these improvement areas, it's really important to get them rolled back into the disaster recovery strategy itself. And once the group is satisfied, that strategy should be presented back to the relevant business stakeholders, and they should ultimately sign off on it. This step, again, it's all about ensuring that everyone is aligned with the approach, relative to the needs of the business. All right, so we've debugged it. Next up, we're gonna execute this strategy. Um, as much as I'd love to be able to just, you know, nuke a database somewhere in our, in our infrastructure, that's not the best way to do this. Um, the best way to do this would be to present a real life data disaster scenario to the people in the accountability, accountability list and have them go through the strategy step-by-step, step, simulating the actions in the plan simulating the actions. You don't actually want them to, to execute the actions themselves. Um, that would be a very elaborate test. So what that means is you actually got to go through the application run books, um, for example, and you want to validate that everything that is in there step-by-step step, is appropriate to the scenario that's been provided to you. And if it's not, document it, make the necessary changes. I guarantee you, every time you do this, you're going to discover something that just didn't work, or is just plain wrong, and really, that's okay. That's the whole point. Again, note them as edits to the strategy and send yourself a you're welcome note to your future version for finding those problems well in advance of whenever that disaster ultimately hits. There's one more pro tip here. Um, again, something that we've kind of learned as we do these tabletop tests, avoid getting hyper-focused on technical aspects. Um, obviously these, these tabletop tests can't run for extended periods. And oftentimes the people on the accountability list have other priorities that they need to look at. So it's really more important that you focus on the procedures itself and less about the technical aspects of the procedure. So whether, you know, you need a dash G or a dash T to restore something using uh, a tool, like that's important to discuss, but that can happen outside the meeting really try and focus more on the processes themselves. That's how you'll get the most value out of these tabletop tests. Uh, I've got a few extra considerations for you here. Um, a business is always changing and therefore your disaster recovery strategy should be changing with it, right? 
your disaster recovery strategy is really trying to maintain business continuity and it's really trying to help make sure that the business is able to meet its objectives. If those objectives change, your disaster recovery strategy should change along with it. So be sure to iterate and revise it as regularly as you need to. Um, quarterly is not too frequent, if you're wondering. After every revision of the strategy, be sure to communicate the strategy to the relevant stakeholders. Again, ensuring alignment. You don't want to get, ever get into a situation where your recovery strategy does not meet the expectations of key business stakeholders. And finally, again, can't stress this one enough either, test your strategy. Uh, this is not my quote. I wish it was. But a DR strategy that is not tested is not worth the paper that it's written on. And I will say amen to that. So because we're here at JiraCon and because Jira tends to hold critical data for so many businesses, I really want to make sure I touch specifically on backing up and restoring Jira Cloud. Um, there's three common approaches to this today. Um, there's certainly others, but these are the three that we tend to see the most. The first is a pure do-it-yourself method where you build something. Uh, the second method would be to use a native feature of, of Jira Cloud. Um, I think Backup Manager has been on Jira Cloud for a number of years now. And then more recently, Atlassian has released their CLI tool. I'm not sure if that's out of beta yet or not. But um, again, native features of the, the, the service itself. And then the third would be using a cloud app to do backups. OK, so when we think about scripting, cron job, do-it-yourself type things, there's really three kind of high-level components to that. Um, this says you need an API key, but really more specifically, what you need is access to the data. And yeah, the API key is the technical requirement, but the key itself needs to be authorized to read and write the relevant data. To help you get started with this do-it-yourself approach, Atlassian's actually published some starter scripts on Bitbucket. Um, it wouldn't take much Googling for you to find them either. Um, they're not very well maintained. I think the last update was back in 2019. Uh, but they're good enough to get you in the direction if this is really the way you want to go. And once you have that script, um, the only thing left to do really is to set something up like uh, using cron or some other job scheduling system to ensure that you're pulling the data at a frequency that's required uh, to meet your RPO. There's some pros and cons to this approach. Um, th these opinions are mine, I suppose. Uh, big pro is that you're not paying someone to do this for you, which is good. That's money in your pocket. Uh, if you have existing infrastructure, that's extra savings potentially for you as well. There are well-defined patterns for running scripts at fixed intervals. So there's, there's ways to easily get started here. On the con side though, um, those scripts, the ones that Atlassian provided, they, they get you backups, but you still got to worry about how you put the data back, the restore stuff. Um, it's not quite there yet. While you're saving money by not paying someone and maybe repurposing infrastructure, you are paying for people's time to build and maintain this system. And you know that's time, again, going back to the, the way that we think about our business, that's time that could have been spent building more value for your customers. So something to think about. And then the last one here is that security and privacy as well as storage, that becomes your responsibility. Um, depending on the makeup of your organization, uh, that could require some cross-functional collaboration uh, to solve that problem. Let's talk uh, quickly about Jira Cloud's native feature called Backup Manager. Uh, again, I think this has been around for some time. I want to say since maybe 2020, 2021, could be even before that. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but there's, uh, they're also uh, exposing some of this functionality in their new CLI tool, which I also mentioned. Both very cool. We're happy to see these things on the platform. Very neat stuff. Uh, and they both basically work the same way. You initiate a backup, you download the data, and you upload it to some secured storage that you have somewhere. Okay? Uh, and there's a lot to like about these native capabilities. You shouldn't need too much coding expertise, if any. Um, a lot of it can be automated. There's decent backup coverage, so uh, uh, definitely a plus there. And it's a core feature of Jira Cloud, which means there's a product manager somewhere at Atlassian looking for customer feedback on how to improve the feature. On the flip side, though, 
Um, restore capabilities are somewhat restrictive at the moment. Uh, you do have to manage the process yourself. And there appears to be some restrictions on how frequently you can perform exports. Uh, I tried this just before the presentation, for example, and um, it's limited to 48 hours if you're looking to do a comprehensive export. So again, thinking about your RPO, um, that could be a lot longer than what's acceptable for you. I don't know. Uh, and then again, lastly, yeah, you're on the hook for privacy, uh, security, and, and storage. Lastly, we have cloud backup apps. Um, while each app in the marketplace has its own unique capabilities, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uniquely positioned to speak about Rewind. Um, and I will say that our system is really designed around the basic flow of install, um, authorize access to your Jira instance, and that's it. You're done. Everything else just sort of happens in the background automatically for you. Um, and this is by design. You don't need to check in on it. There's not a whole lot of configuration. It's very intentional. Again, our, our emphasis is on allowing you to focus on building more value for your customers. So we'll be there for you when that day comes uh, to do a restore. But that's kind of it for, 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 for setting us up. Pretty easy. Um, I've got three pros to cloud backup solutions like Rewind, the first one. Uh, you don't need an engineering investment because there's literally no code to write. There's nothing to maintain. The cloud app is your partner here. You can allocate that engineering investment somewhere else in your business, um, somewhere hopefully that will drive more value. To us, that's a big win. The second is flexible restores and version management. These apps are able to provide a better restore experience in general because that's really the fundamental uh, value proposition that they're trying to offer you, which to me, another huge win. And the third is um, delegation to a trusted third party. You don't have to worry about security, privacy, and storage. That falls into the domain of the cloud app, which is also pretty awesome. You've got a phone number you can pick up and call if you ever have any questions about any of these things. On the other hand, cloud apps do have a non-zero monthly investment, but Generally speaking, uh, that investment is a fraction of the cost of a human investment. <clears throat> and you have to delegate to a trusted third party. And no, that is not a typo. Delegating security, privacy, storage to a third party, that I, like I get it, that can be really tough for a lot of businesses. Fortunately, Atlassian actually does, I think, one of the best jobs of a lot of platforms out there with their cloud fortified program. Another pro tip to me, I think this is pretty common practice for cloud apps, is that they tend to host their security con uh, content at slash security. And you can try this out. Just add slash security to the end of any domain. Go to atlassian.com slash security or rewind.com slash security. And you'll be taken to content that should help you understand the cloud app security posture. Um, and hopefully give you a way to get in touch with somebody to understand more if there's things that still need answering. Uh, that just about does it. It's kind of time for the more salesy part of the presentation, so bear with me. Um, as I said at the beginning, I helped start a backup company because uh, I really wanted businesses to focus on creating value for their customers and not security of their data. It's Rewind's vision to be the ba to back up the cloud and restore it in seconds. Um, and this slide is trying to demonstrate how we're, we're progressing on that particular vision. Uh, Rewind is one of a handful of cloud apps in the Jira marketplace that does what we do. I invite you to check out the installs, the reviews, and the associated content, um, including what I was just mentioning about security, and decide how we compare to others. Uh, to help, we have a special code uh, just for the good folks at this conference. It is quite the code. Um, I don't think you need to worry about scrambling to write it down. I think it's going to get copied into the chat, um, which will hopefully allow you to easily copy and paste it um, should you wish to give us a try. Uh, sign up, like it says here, and get your first two months free. Uh, and also, there's more. But wait, there's more. Um, it wouldn't be a conference if there wasn't some swag and some merch. Uh, who doesn't love swag and merch? So uh, Rewind has its own uh, store where, you know, we like to uh, we like to outfit people 
uh, in, in rewind lore. So um, here's another code that uh, will get you 50 bucks off some rewind merch as well as free shipping. And again, I, I think this code is going to make its way into the chat. And that's it for me. Uh, hopefully you all learned something there. I'm happy to field any questions. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan. Hi. Hey Ryan. I was backstage and I started talking to you and I was like, oh, no one can hear me from a hole in the ground. Um, that's great. That was a great job. Two questions. Mark has, has them both. Um, the first one, I'll just go in order. He says, Atlassian Cloud is on AWS infrastructure. How do you balance backups size slash cost slash time, i.e. using something like an S3 bucket? Um, you have lots of time. You're not on the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> I think the assessment here is really the investment that you want to make back into your program. Um, I'm very aware of the cost profile for S3. I'm also very aware now at the myriad of data set sizes that a JIRA instance can come in. And when you think about incremental backups, um, cost could grow considerably. And so, if I understand the question correctly, I would say the answer really comes back to how you think about investment and whether that is um, a storage solution that meets the investment profile for your strategy. If I didn't answer that question well enough, Mark, please ask it again in a different way. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to his other questions um, and they're good ones because these are ones that we've heard before from people. Uh, and it's almost, I feel like it's two questions, but you can let me know if you think they're two questions. How often do you test out the steps of a strategy and then confirm the data using a sandbox or a separate test site? Because I almost feel like it's two questions, but you let me know if you feel that it's two questions. No, oh, those are great questions. So internally, um, we test them twice a year. Uh, and for us, that's just a case of resource and bandwidth. Um, we've been running our own internal disaster recovery strategy now for almost, almost four years. And what we found is that the incremental changes to the business allows us to kind of follow that cadence. I would say if you're getting started with disaster recovery, it's probably a good idea to do it quarterly, um, simply because you're going to get it wrong the first time. And like I said, every time you run these, you will learn something new. Um, and as you start to, to, to conduct more and more testing and realize, okay, you know, the volume of changes and the volume of edits is going down, um, you could probably start dialing it back a little bit to um, a, a broader cadence. Uh, and caveat to that would be if your business is going through a lot of change, again, you'd probably want to take a look at that strategy a little bit more frequently. Uh, what was the second part of the question? It was, let me go back to there. He said he answered the first one. So you're, you're good there. You got it. Um, okay. Confirming the data, would you use a sandbox, separate test plate? Oh yeah. We do that once a year and it's a similar thing. Um, uh, <laughs> we do that once a year. And for us that, that uh, worked out as like the appropriate um, cadence for our own like risk assessment. We felt pretty confident in the, uh, the the profiles, or excuse me, in the the processes that we had in place that once a year sort of met that. But again, we've been doing this for uh, close to four years now, so um, our risk profile, I think, is a little bit different than than um, perhaps somebody who's just getting started with disaster recovery. I don't see any other question. Oh, yeah. The last question is, where do you like to test sandbox test site or an exact replica of the production environment? I think that's just sort of follow up. Yeah, we we aim for as close to a, a, a representation of the production environment as possible. Obviously, like it's scaled down because for cost considerations, but it's always best to try and validate it against something that looks as close like production as you possibly can. That's just an internal philosophy that we have even outside of disaster recovery here at Rewind. 
Uh, we have a bit more time. People want to ask questions, but I, I'm going to throw some to you, James, myself. Um, sure. Are things that we've talked about over the course of the few years. What sort of led Rewind down the path of really adopting some highly, you know, I hate to use our best practices because it sounds so hollow, but they are, right? I mean, in addition to just being a company that protects other companies' data, you know, I know your philosophy on wanting to create sort of a forward-thinking company around disaster recovery, disaster strategy. What were some of the things that ignited, you know, the fire to sort of drive this into the company? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, first and foremost, it was uh, when this thing looked like it was going to be more than just a, uh, a hobby. <laughs> Um, without getting into the nitty gritty details of Rewind's history, um, there reached an inflection point where we realized that um, we had a real business here in front of us. And so certain things had to change in order to adapt to that. So that's kind of number one. And that to me is when I talk about like changes to your business, that's an example of one of them. Um, we reached a certain maturity point where it was time for us to look at the systems and the processes that we had in place and decide whether they would still meet the needs of a business that was going to grow um, to the rate that we had been growing and expect it to grow into the into the future. That's number one. Um, number two is um, we started to hear more and more from customers uh, about certain compliance requirements. So as we started to move more up market and started to talk more closely with some of uh, what I would call, you know, enterprise like customers. Um, more and more security questions started to come about and questions about certain compliance requirements and um, certifications started to come up. Uh, and Rewind went out and we sought our SOC 2 Type 2 report. And um, availability is one of the uh, security pillars that is part of that SOC 2 Type 2 report. And so, you know, when we saw that, we quickly understood what what is expected of us from customers that request those kinds of compliances. Um, and it became very obvious to us from a, a roadmap point of view, the types of things that we needed to look at. And, and in our case, you know, having a more robust disaster recovery strategy um, just naturally came out of that. Was there, uh, the last one I have for you, is there anything that you sort of learned in the last year as you've iterated on, you know, what Rewind does? Um, you've covered a lot of it in the, in the talk, but I wonder if there's anything like surprising or new that you've learned in the last few months. You're like, oh, this is a new learning for us that you think might be useful for people watching and listening. Uh, I think the biggest one is, um, and maybe this is a cop out, but like legitimately every time we run one of these tabletop tests, we think to ourselves, like, we got this. Like we know what we're doing now and we get everybody who's on that accountability list around the table. And then someone from our trust team throws a scenario in front of us. And inevitably there's a moment where we're like, Oh, yep. We're not really sure what to do about that one. Um, it really just goes back to that idea of testing these procedures really does, um, yield a ton of value and it's such a small investment in the grand scheme of building one of these strategies um it's not like we spend copious amounts of hours doing them when we do do them twice a year uh you know at most they're one to two hours but inevitably the learnings that come out of that um i think are the biggest value that that honestly feels like we just recently did a tabletop test uh for business continuity and the scenario was we're in Ottawa, Canada here, and we're not far from a, a nuclear reactor. And Ottawa is our headquarters. And the question was, okay, well, what would happen if there was a radiation leak? And we were just like, oh, okay. We started listing off all these things and we were just like, okay, well, we don't have a procedure for that. We don't have a procedure for this. Yeah. And these are things that, not to say that there's going to be a radiation leak at the, 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 the nuclear plant that's not far from us here, but in a world with climate change happening and all these other types of um, macro uh, events, you never know. And having concrete plans in place um, are, is the best way to protect yourself. Okay. Um, last question I'll ask, and just then we can let people go for the day and 
prepare for the next slate of wonderful um, talks to come. One of the top re- things we see is we people who have come in and they are that DIY person, like they've built something over time. Um, you know, they sort of manage it uh, and they're, but they're still a little skeptical about making the switch. They think, yeah, I, you know what? I can still probably get away with this over time with all these, you know, Frankenstein pieces. You know, you've seen a lot of this over the years now as a, what could you, would you tell someone, you know, that's in that position and their companies continue to grow and they're just adopt their tech stack gets bigger. They have more, more people into these pieces of software. What do you see that becomes sort of untenable over time? Was the question, when do I see that being untenable? Yeah. What, or what, like, when do you see that or what do you see break down? Yeah. Um, it tends to be as like complexity starts to rise within the business. And it's hard for me to say like where that inflection point will be. But as you said, when the tech stack continues to grow, the number of people grows, uh, potentially people that were part of the project to build this Frankenstein backups, um, DIY solution, um, you know, they leave the business. There's no ownership of it. It's not clear uh, where the information about how it works, how like where that lies. Um, yeah, it's some like natural progression where complexity uh, outweighs the benefit, maybe the perceived benefit of trying to manage that system internally. It's hard for me to put my finger on like what that actually is, though, because to be fair, it could be different for for every company. Mm-hmm. But it is, I, I do feel like it's a, it's a measure of complexity, overall complexity within the business. Avril just asked a question. Thank you for that. We have multiple sites within our cloud org. Any suggestions on how to handle a uh, disaster recovery strategy for that? Many JIRA sites? Uh, we have multiple sites within our cloud org. I don't know if you wanted to add in the chat, Avril, just like a clarifier around that. Um, but uh, many cloud orgs is what... Is how she's framed the question. Okay. Multiple sites well, within our cloud org. Sorry, multiple sites within our cloud org. She might have just clarified I, it here. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay, I the 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 fundamental principle I think still applies regardless of the number of of sites that you're you're dealing with. Um, whether you treat like a site on its own as um, how do I want to describe this? Each site could be treated as its own um, instance that needs its own disaster recovery strategy. Uh, and you could treat one site as a JIRA site, a second site, whether it was a, a Bitbucket instance that needs its own disaster recovery strategy or conf- like, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but the point I'm trying to make is that the number you have is kind of irrelevant. You should look at each individual site you should measure the um, the value, the criticality of the data, and treat them and give them their due respect for a uh, disaster recovery strategy, as if they were separate cloud applications. Did that did that make sense to you, Ryan? Oh, you're on mute. I'm on mute. One of the things we see is people will come in. That makes sense. Several says. Um, okay. Thank you. One of the things we see is people, when they might not come to us, and they might come to us for Jira. Well, actually, Jira is one of the top products that people come to us for. And we'll talk to them about their other technology stack, um, you know, for developer operations or maybe some of the future products that we're building. And they say, you know, sounds good. We're not there yet. And then a year later, they'll say, we just went through a risk assessment. It's there now. Let's talk, right? Like it, it, it's all based on the evolution of the business and what, yeah, what data is in there and is it vital to the operations, whether it's the team or the business at large. Okay, I think we have more questions. We can give everyone back ten minutes. Great job, James. Okay, thanks everybody. Mm-hmm.